What's up guys, it's WackyMod84 here, and I think now is a good time to make a video about this. As of just a little while ago, Gundam Seed Destiny HD Remastered has officially begun, and Episode 1 is now on YouTube. And now all of a sudden, my inbox is getting slammed left and right with messages asking me what my thoughts on it are, if I think it's gonna be good or bad, if I think it's gonna be, like, somewhat better, and ugh, it just doesn't end today. So you know what? I'm gonna take this opportunity and make an FAQ video, where I answer a lot of people's questions they gave me in the past, right here right now for everyone to hear what I have to say to them so let's cut the bullshit and let's get down to business shall we let's get the obvious question out of the way what are my thoughts on Gundam Seed Destiny HD remastered well like all Gundam series before it I am going to give it a chance I mean it's Seed Destiny it's nothing I'm not familiar with I mean I have watched Gundam Seed Destiny over 40 times now I am not fucking kidding I have a tally of how many times I watch Gundam animes Gundam Seed Destiny before HD Remastered, I have watched exactly 47 times. I have the tally up in a notepad right now. And HD Remastered will be my 48th. I know that a lot of people are gonna call bullshit on me with that because that sounds like an unbelievable number for someone like me to watch Gundam Seed Destiny that many times despite how much I fucking hate it. But I'll tell you guys the real reason that keeps bringing me back to Gundam Seed Destiny over and over again. Every time I watch Gundam Seed Destiny all the way through, it's like I keep finding more and more shit wrong with it that I I missed the last time I watched it. In which case, out of extreme curiosity, I keep going back to check if I miss anything. That's one of the biggest reasons that keeps bringing me back to Seed Destiny over and over again. And believe me, I did the same thing with Gundam Wing before Seed came around. Gundam Wing I currently have watched over 33 times. According to the tally, that is. And it was in a similar situation that Seed Destiny was in, because that one I honestly had extremely mixed feelings about. With all the plot holes, plot armor moments, inconsistencies, contradictions and all that shit with Gundam Wing, I had the very same mindset that I do with Seed Destiny that I did with Gundam Wing in the past. Which leads into another question that some people have asked me before about the tally. They wanted to know the full list of it, how many times I've watched all Gundam animes up to this point. Well, that's fine. I'll tell you guys right now. Here, I have the tally up right now. Okay, let's start from the beginning. 0079, 15 times. 8th MS Team, 11 times. MS Igloo, 3 times. War in the Pocket, 5 times. Stardust Memory, 7 times. Zeta Gundam, 18 times. Double Zeta, 4 times. Shars Counterattack, 13 times. Gundam Unicorn, up to this point, 9 times. F91, 4 times. Victory, 3 times. G Savior, once anymore and I probably would have died of boredom. Gundam Wing, 33 times. Gundam Wing Endless Waltz, 21 times. G Gundam, 14 times. Gundam C, 36 times, one of them being HD Remastered. Gundam C Destiny, as I said before, 47 times, the 48th one being HD Remastered starting now. Gundam Seed Stargazer, 9 times. Gundam 00, 27 times. Gundam 00 The Movie, 5 times. Gunpla Builders, 5 times. Gundam X, 8 times. Turn A Gundam, 4 times. Gundam Age, twice for now that is i do plan to go back to gundam age more and take a look at it in further detail later because there is a lot i have to say about that anime this tally dates back all the way to 1997 when i was six and a half years old yes you heard that correctly i became a gundam fan when i was a mere six and a half years old of course that's not when i started the tally but i included all the times that i watched gundam back then until now when i started this tally was back in late 2003 early 2004 but yeah yeah, you get the point. But yeah, with that said, I think now you guys can probably see why I care about Gundam as much as I do, to the point where it sometimes looks like I'm totally obsessed with it. Which, yeah, I admit, yes, I am obsessed with Gundam. But you know what? Gundam is something that really did change my life as a person. It helped me think about a lot of things from different perspectives. And it actually helped me improve my understanding about a lot of things in life. Whether it be war, politics, etc., all that kind of shit. But Gundam also taught me about fiction, about how to make a well-told story, how to make well-balanced characters, and all that shit. Gundam was the one that taught me all of that shit, along with Macross as well. Gundam and Macross are my two favorite animes of all time, and they were the ones that taught me all of that. So all in all, Gundam is in my blood, and it's a part of who I am. Now, on to my next question. Wacky, do you like Shin better than Kira? Yes, absolutely. 
But that's not saying much. Shin alone is a bad character, but he's a different type of bad character than Kira. In one corner, we got Kira Yamato, a Mary Sue who is disgustingly perfect in all ways. And in the other corner, we got Shin Asuka, who is what you would call an anti-Sue, which is the exact opposite of a Mary Sue. He's wrong about everything, he's on everyone's shit list, he always gets in trouble, he has a bad attitude about everything, he's incredibly stupid, and very little about his character is likable. A lot of people claim they don't like Shin because he's a whiny little bitch and all that shit, but you know what? That's not why I don't like Shin, at all. I actually kinda like Shin's douchebag nature. After all, that's an actual personality flaw, and that actually helps balance him out a little bit. However, what I don't like about Shin is his intelligence. Oh my good god. In terms of intelligence, Shin has the IQ of a fucking fruit bat. He is literally so stupid that it hurts. His reasoning about the authors being the ones responsible for his family getting murdered at Onagoro makes no goddamn sense. It's not like the authors ordered Shin's family to be killed. What the fuck is he blaming them for? There's a word that goes with deaths like that in war, Shin. It's called collateral damage. And that's the real truth about what happened to Shin's family. But no, Shin may makes this solemn vow that no, Orb is totally at fault. They were the ones that killed my family. No, not the Earth Federation. No, that wasn't collateral damage at all. Fuck that. <laughs> the irony behind it is, Kira was the one that killed them in the first place. Well, him and Orga in the Calamity, but yeah, they both were the ones that did it. Of course it wasn't their fault. I mean, they probably didn't even know they were there. But again, collateral damage. It's really unfortunate that it happened, but that's war. And of course, adding to his stupidity was when Shin gets a hold of the Destiny Gundam. It's it's at that time in the anime where once he gets the Destiny Gundam, everything just goes horribly wrong and takes a turn for the worse with his character. They literally rolled out the red carpet for him to switch sides at that point. But Shin just basically says, fuck all of that, I don't want to do that shit. And at that point, he basically becomes Durandal's ass slave, following his every single command without question till the very end. And I haven't even talked about his combat skills going out the window yet. If anything, the attack on Heaven's base is probably the best battle the Destiny has ever been in in the entire anime. But is it just me, or is the Destiny's Arendite a downgrade from the Impulse's Excalibur? I mean, okay, the Arendite can fold up on the Destiny's back when it's not in use, fine and dandy. But what I'm talking about is on the Excalibur, the Excalibur actually has the ability to extend the beam over the tip of the blade for not just impaling purposes, but also slicing larger targets. Targets. This also explains how the Impulse was able to impale the Freedom in the Freedom vs. Impulse battle despite the Freedom having phase shift armor. That makes perfect sense because it extended the blade over the tip to stab through the Freedom's reactor with. This actually was one of the complaints I had with the Sword Strikes anti-ship sword to begin with, because if you could see with the Sword Strikes anti-ship sword, this piece right here, which is not sharpened, looks like it could easily get stuck on something if you try to stab or swing a larger target with it, since unlike the Excalibur, this part is not sharpened. That's why I actually like the Sword Impulse, because it actually fixed that design. The Destiny's Arundite, however, goes back to that design. Why? I don't get it. That one unsharpened piece at the tip that looks like it can get stuck is back again. And this time, the Arendite can extend the blade over the tip like the Excalibur could. So that's what gives me reason to believe that the Arendite was a downgrade from the Excalibur. It seems less practical. But honestly, in terms of practicality, anti-ship swords have always been impractical. There's no denying that. Anti-ship swords can easily be destroyed by just slicing them in the non-beam blade side, right in the back. And there you go, you just lost a melee weapon. But out of all of them, the Excalibur was the one that came the closest to being the most practical out of all anti-ship sword models in existence. But the one that was most practical goes to the Goof Ignited's anti-ship sword, which the beam blade covers both sides. That is what the fuck I'm talking about. That is a lot better and much more practical. The only downside is that with the Goof Ignited's anti-ship sword, the beam cannot extend over the tip like the Excalibur can. But you know what? It's 
it's a grunt unit. What the fuck did you expect? Yes, it does seem like I'm going off topic, but this does actually have something to do with Shin's piloting skills as a whole, because now that I've explained that the Arendite is kind of a downgrade from the Excalibur, that does raise the question. How the hell was the Arendite sword able to slice right down the middle of a destroy Gundam like that without that one piece at the tip getting stuck? Another weird one was how he was able to impale a destroy Gundam when destroy Gundams clearly have face shift armor and the tip cannot have a beam extended over it like the Excalibur could. And don't even get me started with the whole Shin finger bullshit. You know, how Shin uses the palm of Fiocina's like a fucking idiot as if he's pretending to be Domon Kashu doing Shining Finger. Wait, wait, what the f- How would the- What?! Okay, you can't do that, Shin. That's fucking impossible. The palm of Eocena is a beam cannon. You cannot just simply punch your way through face shift armor with a glowy hand like that, okay? Clearly, Shin fired the shot after he punched his way through the armor, not before. I call bullshit, Shin. But yeah, I'll get this question out of the way because this is actually something I was going to answer later on, but since we're on the topic of the palm of Eocenas, why not get it out of the way? Someone has asked me, has Shin ever used the palm of Eocenas? seen us properly yes yes he has twice that's it just twice out of the whole fucking second half of Sea Destiny. The first time he used them kind of properly was during the Destiny's debut, when he was chasing down Atherin in that goof ignited. He did use them as a ranged weapon at that time, but very close up, so he was kind of pushing it with that one. The second one was at the Invasion of Orb. Take a look at this guy right over here in the background. Notice how he gets killed by a blue beam instead of a green one. I wonder where that came from. The Palm of Fiocina shoots blue beams, and I don't really see anyone else who shoots blue beams in this anime besides the Destiny Gundam, so yeah, seems like a Palma Fiocina to me. Especially since right after that shot, the Destiny comes and slices that Orb Murasame in half, so there you go! Shin has ultimately proven that he is fully capable of using the Palma Fiocinas the way they were intended to be used. He's just being a fucking idiot and pretending to be Domon Kashu with that shit. But the straw that broke the camel's back with him in terms of combat skills was that at the very end when he was fighting the infinite justice when out of nowhere he thinks that it was a good idea to try and catch beam sabers with his bare fucking hands palma fiocinas do not work like that shin they're called energy shields you know the ones you have on your forearms the ones kind of like the strike freedom the legend and the infinite justice have the ones that you've blocked beam sabers with in the past with hello but i guess at that point since shin was in a panicked rage I guess the only thing going through his mind was his shining finger. Oh shit! But as a whole, in terms of comparing Shin to Kira, I most definitely like Shin better, because at least Shin is more realistic than Kira. But that's not saying much of him being a good character. You know what I would have preferred? A balanced character. Not a Mary Sue, not an anti-Sue, just a balanced character. Is that too much to ask for? Especially since Gunham's been doing that for like all these years, why the hell did Seed stop all of a sudden? You wanna know who else was an anti-Sue and yet still a much better character? Amuro Ray! What's the difference? Amuro had character development. Two animes and a movie worth of it. Shin had none. Which brings me to another question that someone asked me relating to what I just said. Wacky, let me ask you something. Aren't there any Mary Sues out there that are considered likable? Absolutely! Mary Sue's can be done right! In fact, there's a whole subgenre of Mary Sue's that are basically just that. This type of Mary Sue is known as a parody Sue. Parody Sue's are basically Mary Sue's that are made like that on purpose for the sole reason of making fun of all of the reasons why Mary Sue's are bad to begin with. They're basically being Mary Sue's for comedic purposes, for laughs, to make fun of all the reasons why Mary Sue's are bad, and all the cliches and over you shit that Mary Sue's are always involved with. Some examples include Miko Shiragane from Powerpuff Girls Z, Hercule from Dragon Ball Z, Harui Suzumiya from Melancholy Adventures, absolutely on her, Franziska Von Karma from Phoenix Wright, Curtis from Disgaea, Erika Furudo from Umineko no Nakukoro Ni, Flynn from Tales of Vesperia on the PS3, Dante from Devil May Cry, not including the new one, and of course Yancey Fry from Futurama. So 
So as you can see, Mary Sue's can be done right just as long as they're made for comedic purposes and are not meant to be taken seriously. As long as you establish them as that type of Mary Sue, then you're fine. That can work. Which leads me into my next question, which also coincides with this same topic. Wacky, what is the worst Mary Sue you have ever seen in your life? I bet you guys expect me to say Kira and Lacus, right? Fortunately, that's not the case. Don't get me wrong though, Lacus is definitely in second place, without question. However, with Kira, I'm a little reluctant to call him for third place just yet, because I'm still not quite sure if he's that bad. I'm not sure if there are other Mary Sues out there in anime that are worse than him or not, but from what I have personally seen so far, Kira does make it into third place as the third worst Mary Sue of all time. Believe me, if anyone else has seen Mary Sues that are worse than him, just let me know and I'll take a look at him. But from what I've seen so far, Kira is ranked at number three, Lacus is ranked at number two, and you're probably thinking, what the fuck could be worse than Lacus? Well, I've got three words for you. Shadow the Hedgehog. Holy fucking shit. Like, what was Shadow the Hedgehog saying? I am Shadow the Hedgehog, the ultimate life form? Yeah, right. More like the ultimate Mary Sue. Every single goddamn Mary Sue trait you can possibly think of, Shadow has it, and more. I have so much shit on Shadow's Mary Sue resume that me and a friend of mine actually made up a fucking notepad and put them all down. He is that bad. You wanna see it? Here, take a look. You wanna read that shit? Pause the video and then play when you're done. So yeah, as of this point in time, Shadow the Hedgehog is the worst Mary Sue I have ever seen in my entire life. And I hope to God that no one will ever surpass that level of Mary Sue or even come up to par with it ever again. Lacus already came close enough. And before you guys say anything, yes, I know the proper term for a male Mary Sue is called a Gary Stew. But you know what? I'm fucking lazy. And honestly, Kira is so fucking flamboyant as hell that he might as well be called a Mary Sue. Now, on to the next question. Wacky, why do you hate the impulse? I don't hate the impulse. I mean, just earlier in this video, I credited it for having improved mobile suit design over the strike. If I hated it, why would I compliment it? If you ask me, the impulse is actually a pretty good Gundam. For the most part, at least. Then why did you say you were gonna make a rant video about it if you don't hate it? Oh, that's what you're talking about. Alright, you want me to tell you why? Alright, fine, I'll get the impulse out of the way for this video, because that's one less thing I have to do. Because honestly, with the impulse, I have one complaint. One fucking complaint about the impulse. You wanna know what it is? I've got two words for you. Destiny Silhouette! Oh, what, you didn't know? Yeah, read him and weep. This is the prototype of what the Destiny Gundam was based off of. This was what came first. This silhouette alone raises the Impulse's reference count from two Gundams to five. I don't even need to comment. I mean, you guys have seen my Destiny Gundam rant how many fucking times by now? I mean, yes, I did take both my Destiny and Strike Freedom rants down as of recently, but don't worry, they're coming back. I'm just fixing them, that's it. But yeah, aside from the Destiny silhouette, the Impulse for the most part is a pretty good Gundam, but there's one thing I've always questioned about the Impulse. If the Impulse has a Chaos Silhouette, a Gaia Silhouette, and an Abyss Silhouette... Oh uh, wait, you didn't know that either? Uh, yeah, it has a Chaos Gaia and Abyss Silhouette as well. What are the odds, right? But yeah, if the Impulse has a Silhouette for the Chaos Gaia and Abyss, why did they waste their time building a separate Gundam for each of those silhouettes? I mean, wouldn't the smarter thing to do would be to make more Impulse Gundams instead, since they all have that ability as well? And if you count the four Sword and Blast silhouettes with that as well, that's six silhouettes they have at their disposal. In terms of battle strength, mass producing the Impulse sounds like it would have been a better idea instead of just making a separate Gundam for each of the three Chaos Gaia and Abyss silhouettes. But yeah, that's my take on the Impulse Gundam. Aside from the Destiny Silhouette, it's a pretty good Gundam. How many references does it have besides the Destiny Silhouette? Just two. Victory Gundam and Strike Gundam. And that's totally forgivable. Just as long as you pretend the Destiny Silhouette doesn't exist, which is exactly what I do. Next one up. Ooh, this is a good one. Wacky, why does unoriginality bother you this badly? I'll tell you exactly why. Because after seeing the music industry, the movie industry, a lot of the entertainment industry, and all that shit just 
stop giving all fucks about making their own work and just recycling past works over and over again. It pisses me off to no end that creativity seems to be going out the fucking window nowadays. I mean, look at movies nowadays. How many of them are just being brought back for the sole purpose of being 3 d -ified? And as for the music industry, well, I do admit it's gotten a little bit better over the years since it was back in like 2004-2006. But seriously, every Everywhere you look, it's just samples from other people's music. It's ridiculous. Unoriginality is something that's always bothered me, and in Gundam, it is no different. This is exactly why I praise Gundams like the Turn A Gundam, Beginning 30 Gundam, Cassie Gundam, Penelope, and the XS Gundam. Those Gundams are what you call original and unique. I want to see more shit like that in the future. Hell, even Gundam Age. The Vegan mobile suits are fucking awesome. Those have to be some of the most unique designs I've ever seen in Gundam since the days of Turn A. It's just too bad that Gundam Age did an even worse job of explaining its technology to us than Seed did. But yeah, that's why unoriginality bothers me that much. Alright, next question. Oh, shit. Zap Zephyr X, I hope you're watching this video because this next one is totally for you. Wacky, all you've done is really bash Seed. What are some things you actually liked about Seed? Again, Zap, I think this is also calling out to you right here because you asked me the same thing. So yeah, let's get it out of the way, shall we? Let's talk about some of the things that I actually liked about Seed and Seed Destiny. Let's start off with favorite characters. In the first seed, my favorite character of all time was Raul La Crusade, Mula Flaga being a very close second. Raul La Crusade was awesome. He is definitely in my top five best Char clones of all fucking time. He's basically if Char Aznable were evil and was more of a douche. But Rao actually does make the whole douchebag thing actually work. I especially love that scene in Seed where Flay actually has him at gunpoint in his office and Rao looks at her, he's like, oh, isn't that cute? And then he just flat out says to her, believe me, you don't want to do that. The second you pull that trigger, you could kiss your ass goodbye because the guards would hear you. By the way, that gun is loaded, right? God, I get a kick out of that scene every single time. I also like that conversation that Athrum was having with Rao on the elevator when Lacus went missing about how they were gonna go look for her, but Athrum was against it because he thought it would be a waste of time, but then Rao's like, oh, come on, really? You're gonna be that guy? Go rescue her, dude! She's your fiancé! What kind of gentleman are you? But the one that really sealed the deal with me with loving Rao as my favorite character was at the end, where he was in the Providence and was just about to attack the Eternal, and then he says to Lacus, it's a shame, really. I really did like your songs. But unfortunately, the real world isn't as kind as the one in pop songs. Oh, yes! Slap that bitch with some sense! Fuck yeah! God, do I love that scene! Rao just got a massive round of applause from me the first time I heard that. Not to mention, I really do like the Providence Gundam a lot, in the way it fights and the way it looks visually. As for everyone on the Archangel, my favorite characters out of all of them were Mula Flaga, Natal Bajirul, and I know I'm gonna get slammed with hate for this one, Flay Ulster. <laughs> Relax, calm down, I will totally explain this, because a lot of you are probably thinking, what the fuck is is wrong with you wacky how the hell can you like that bitch yeah i noticed that our gundam on reddit questioned me in the same way you're questioning me right now about that but don't get me wrong i don't like flay as a person i like her as a character why because out of everyone in gundam seed she's actually one of the very few people that has flaws in her character it's because she's a conniving bitch that i actually found her to be interesting not likable but interesting nonetheless now about Lieutenant Badgerel. Oh my dear Jesus, do I wish she was the captain of the Archangel instead of Ramius. Oh good God. Ramius was a joke. She is easily the worst captain in Gundam history. Badgerel was way more qualified to be the captain of the Archangel than Ramius could ever hope to be. Unlike Ramius, Badgerel has balls. She knows when to express authority and to discipline her subordinates. She actually uses strategy 
strategy to take out her opponents in battle, as she clearly demonstrated on the Archangel CIC, and when she was on board the Dominion as well. She knows the proper procedures for handling shit around the military, and she was way more qualified for a job like this than Romulus was. She was lawful neutral, but that's why I liked her. That's what made her interesting. And the fact that she's one of the very few people on the Archangel that has a brain, or at least one that's big enough to think logically about shit. Now, Mula Flaga. What can you say about him? He's definitely one of my favorite characters in the show. In case anybody didn't know, Gundam Seed has not one, not two, but three Shark clones. Mula Flaga was one of them. Well, kind of. He was more of a Quattrobagina clone than a Shar clone, but yeah, he still fit the description of one. But if you ask me, I think he's more of a Quattrobagina slash Slegger Law kind of hybrid. But still a Shar clone nonetheless. I really did like Mula Flaga. He's very skilled in combat, thanks with a cool head. He's probably one of the most friendliest people on the Archangel. And the fact that he can kick ass in nothing but a Sky Grasper and a Mobile Armor is alone enough to show his skill. Seriously though, I wanted to see more than just one battle of him piloting the perfect strike gun and that was fucking awesome! Another one I liked was Athrin Zala. For those who don't know, Athrin is one of the three Shark clones in Seed. Not really a very good Shark clone, but as a character, he was pretty good in the first Seed. For the first half of Gundam Seed, Athrin was completely lawful neutral. He didn't actually want to fight Kira, but he had no choice because he was still a soldier and Kira was an enemy. So that created kind of an inner conflict with him that he had to go through for a while until the breaking point, which was Nicole's death. That is what caused Athrin to fight finally snap and just go ape shit on Kira. And thank God. Speaking of which, a little off topic, I really like that HD Remastered actually fixed the Strike vs. Aegis battle in terms of how it flowed. That whole slideshow bullshit in the first Gundam Seed not HD Remastered actually annoyed me. Now that they animated that, it's way better. I also like Athrin's mobile suits a lot. The Aegis and the Justice were both fucking awesome, and the Infinite Justice in Seed Destiny is easily my favorite Gundam out of the three main ones in Seed Destiny, without a doubt. The Infinite Justice was completely original, it was piloted by someone who knew how to fight well, it's a melee-oriented mobile suit that takes actual skill to use, and its weapons were pretty damn cool. The only mobile suit that I did not like with Athrin was the Savior. Now don't get me wrong, I don't hate the Savior, I just don't like it. Unoriginality is my main complaint with it. In terms of its mobile suit design being impractical or not, the savior is totally fine in that department. It's just unoriginal because it rips off three and a half Gundams, that's all. Those Gundams being Wing Zero, Zeta, F91, and half of Double X. So yeah, I don't hate it, I just don't like it. Simple as that. Now let's talk about some characters from Sea Destiny, shall we? My favorite character of all time in Sea Destiny is easily Talia Gladys. She is basically Maru Ramius done right. She was a brilliant combat strategist, she showed plenty of authority to her subordinates, she ran the ship very well, and when Shin went AWOL, thank God she sent him to the brig. Unlike Kira, when he went AWOL, Ramius just gave him a slap on the wrist, laying down the law. Now that's what I want to fucking see in a situation like that. But the best thing I love about Talia Gladys so much is that she is immune to Lacus Klein's Mary Sue bullshit. After that speech at Orb that Lacus gave, everyone was in a panic. Everyone and their mother was going around going, oh my god, there's two Lacus Kleins, who's the real one? Oh my god. When Talia Gladys came out and says, uh, guys, what the hell's the big deal? It's not like Lacus Klein is our commanding officer or anything. Thank you! Finally! It's about fucking time! That right there is what sealed the deal with me in regards to Talia Gladys being my favorite character of all time in Sea Destiny. She actually had a brain, as opposed to 95% of the characters in Sea Destiny being complete dipshits. Another character I liked was Mir Campbell. She was definitely up there with Talia as one of the best characters in the whole anime. And in the end, I definitely sympathized with her. She was basically chosen to be the next Lacus Klein in replace of the old one who went missing 
thing after the first Bloody Valentine War, and she basically got corrupted by her own fame. She was actually pretty interesting. I cared about Mir a shitload more than I would ever give a damn about Lacus, that's for sure. Oh shit, that's right, I haven't even talked about Izak and Diarka. Izak is another one that I really appeal to, mainly because he's the angry, hot-blooded type, but at least he thinks rationally, unlike Shin. But I also did like Diarka as well, and I found it kind of interesting that he was voiced by Brad Swale in the English dub of Seed. Some of my friends found that to be funny, and they call him Black Amaro as a result. I just wish we saw more of them in Seed Destiny. I mean, in Seed Destiny, they were barely even there. Now, in terms of Luna Maria, even though she is completely useless to the story's progression, I at least acknowledge that she is a good pilot, and she is a good person. So I'll give her credit on that, at least. Now, lastly, before I move on to mobile suit designs, I want to talk about Gilbert Durandal and the Destiny plan. Gilbert Durandal, I gotta say, isn't as bad as people make him out to be, if you ask me. I mean, for 85% of Sea Destiny, his decisions that he's made seemed perfectly valid, and it wouldn't really make that much sense to disagree with them. He seemed to know what he was doing for 85% of the time. I really liked how Durandal basically told off Athrin in the hangar when the Destiny and Legend were first debuted, where Athrin was calling out the chairman on giving the order to shoot down the Archangel and the Freedom. Durandal Randall flat out told him, Okay, fine, let me ask you this. Why the hell didn't they come to us and tell us of their intentions? What the fuck were we supposed to think? All they were doing was just jumping into random battles, making things worse. They were acting like complete terrorists, and we dealt with the situation accordingly. In which case, he was absolutely right. All Kira and the Archangel were doing was just making things worse. They were basically celestial being, but doing it wrong. So yeah, Chairman Durandal did what he had to do. They had to be stopped, and Durandal made the right call. Now, as for the Destiny plan, this is where things could get a little bit interesting. I know my buddy, the Anime Overview, is probably going to be interested in this part, because the Destiny plan is honestly something I have a lot to say about. To be honest, the Destiny plan, again, is not as bad as people make it out to be, but it's definitely not a great plan, per se. If you want the truth, the Destiny plan basically is Brave New World on steroids. For those who haven't heard of it, Brave New World is basically a novel that pretty much shows what it would look like if the Destiny plan actually happened, except not quite as harsh as what Durandal had in mind. In Brave New World, your destiny is decided for you based on what you're best at and what you love the most. And you are basically forced to do what you love the most and what you're best at in life for the rest of your life, but at the cost of your own free will. There are some differences, though, between this and the Destiny Plan. The Destiny Plan does not allow free will whatsoever. If you have free will, you are a threat. If you disagree with the Destiny Plan, that makes you a threat to humanity itself, and you gotta be killed off. In Brave New World, if you're unsatisfied with how you live in society, there you go, the door's open, go ahead. As there's a group of people who live out outside society with free will that are known as savages in Brave New World, but yeah, people with free will can still do what they want if they're not satisfied with how things are in society. But the question is, why wouldn't you be satisfied? I mean, yes, you don't have free will, but you're being forced to do what you love the most and what you're best at in life. The question here is, why would you want to not do that if it's what you love and what you're best at? Why would you not be happy with a deal like that? Obviously, speaking as someone who has free will, of course I'm gonna disagree with a plan like this. This shit is extremely unethical, but it at least is something to talk about, you know? It's just too bad that Durandal basically had it much more harsher than in Brave New World. That's what made it even harder to agree with on his end. But, in Brave New World, there were no wars or anything like that, so he was right about that part. But is it really worth it to give up your free will just to do what you're best at and what you love the most for the rest of your life against your will? It's unethical as fuck, but it's at least something to think about, you know? The problem here is Brave New World is a novel. A novel that talks about this shit right from the beginning. Destiny is an anime that introduced this shit 
right out of left field in the last, like, ten or so episodes. It was already on the home stretch, and they didn't nearly have enough time to cover all the details on this plan to begin with. But yeah, that's why I say the Destiny plan isn't as bad as what people are making it out to be, but it's still an unethical as hell plan to begin with. But it's still something to think about, to say the least. Oh, and Andrew Waltfeldt? I actually found him to be a pretty good Ramba Raw clone, for the most part. Although he was cutting it really close with surviving the Legos explosion. But at least he didn't get brought back without a consequence. He lost an eye and an arm. Unlike Mula Flaga, who took a low and grin to the face and came out with nothing but a scar. As for the druggies, I liked the first set of druggies a lot better than the Phantom Pain kids. They were fun to watch, I gotta admit. Which that brings me to the next part, the mobile suit designs. For the most part, with some obvious exceptions as we all know, the mobile suit designs in Seed and Seed Destiny are actually pretty damn cool. The Jin, the Zaku Warrior, the Goof Ignited, the Sagu, the Estrays, the Strike Daggers, the Windoms. I actually really like them. Other than the ones I pointed out, for the most part, the mobile suit designs in Seed and Destiny were pretty good. Now, I know my buddy, the anime overviewer, has told me multiple times that he thinks the perfect strike Gundam is, like, a mess in its design, but just hear me out for a sec, Chris. While yes, you are absolutely right in saying that the Perfect Strike Gundam is way over cumbersome with all that shit slapped on it, the Perfect Strike Gundam still got its own significance because Mula Flaga went out there with all of the packs on him despite how over cumbersome and bulky it was, the fact that he actually managed to make it work and actually fight very effectively with all three packs is what gives the perfect strike Gundam its own significance. The same can be said about the full armor unicorn Gundam, which I know you have the same opinion about as well. It's bulky as hell, has a shitload of guns slapped on it, etc. But hey, Menager actually managed to make it work, so it still has some significance to itself with that. Now, with the Archangel and the Minerva, in terms of which one of them is the better ship, I would pick the Minerva in a heartbeat. Compared to the Archangel, which is basically the not-white-based ship of the Cosmic Era, the Minerva has a much more original and unique design to it, but also the crew interactions on the Minerva were unbelievably better than the ones on the Archangel. I mean, the Minerva actually has security for a change, unlike the Archangel. Remember when Kira snuck onto the strike and went AWOL? Well, there was absolutely no security in the hangar whatsoever. This also applies to Kigali sneaking out with a Sky Grasper, as well as the incident where Sai tried to pilot the strike. Seriously, where the hell are all the damn guards? The security on the Archangel is a fucking joke! Thankfully, the Minerva's security is far superior, and a lot more realistic. And as I said before, I praise the Minerva on its design. It really is a badass looking warship, and is without a doubt my favorite warship in the entire cosmic era. I really like how the Minerva actually can lower its bridge into a more heavily armored area when it goes to condition red. That right there is excellent ship design and it makes it that much harder for the enemy to destroy the bridge. And finally, honestly, who doesn't agree with me on this one? Seed and Seed Destiny had an amazing soundtrack. Probably one of the best in all of Gundam. I mean, what do we got? We got TM Revolution, Hitomi Takahashi, Nami Tamaki, Seesaw, High and Mighty Color. You gotta admit, for a soundtrack, that is one hell of a resume. So now, Zap, are you satisfied? I just proven to you that there are plenty of things that I actually liked about Seed and Destiny. So to all those out there who think I am nothing but a Seed hater, that there's nothing about Seed and Destiny that I like, think again. Next question. <laughs> okay. I am 70% positive that this next question is from the Church of Jesus Yamato. But here it is. Turn A Gundam is fucking gay. How the hell can you love that mustache-wearing monstrosity the way you do? That thing is fucking ugly. Okay, yeah, you could be the judge about where that's from. I'm not saying it is from them. I'm not saying it isn't from them, but whatever. Anyway, to answer this question, anyone who is still in question about what is the ugliest Gundam in the world, if you think Turn A Gundam is ugly in your eyes, I present to you... Nick's Providence Gundam. I don't even need to comment. Like, what the fuck am I even looking at? What, did Pablo Picasso redesign the Providence Gundam? What, what the fuck is this? 
Okay, the last question of the night. Ooh. Okay, yeah, this one isn't as much of a question as it is an angry comment towards me. So, yeah, here it is. Nobody gives a fuck about what you think. Just shut up already. We get it. You hate Seed and Destiny. We get it. It doesn't make any sense about the shit that happens in there. It's an anime. It doesn't have to make sense. Stop being so paranoid with this shit and shoving your opinion down other people's throats, you fucking asshole. Okay, first things first. When have I ever forced anyone to hate Gundam Seed just because of my own views? Never. Not even once. At no point have I ever pointed a gun to somebody's head and saying, Hate Gundam Seed or you're going to hell. Never. I would never do something like that. Ever. Me doing something like that is being just as bad as the Church of Jesus Yamato. That's not me. Yes, I am very vocal with my opinion on Gundam Seed and Destiny, or rather Gundam in general, but at no point do I ever force my opinion on anyone. Ever. To those who think that that's what I'm doing, you are taking my opinion way too seriously. Remember, it's just that, an opinion. Everyone is entitled to one. You're making it seem like I have a grudge against all of the Gundam Seed community. Dude, the Church of Jesus Yamato takes up like 10, maybe 15% of the Gundam Seed fan community? That's nothing! That is a very small handful right there. So the people out there who love Seed and Destiny despite all their major problems, if they acknowledge the goods and the bads of what they love, go ahead! Have fun! Enjoy it! More power to you guys! I'll throw like a Gundam Seed themed barbecue for you guys. I'll make you a little fucking Flay Ulster Pinata for you to beat the shit out of. And if you ever see anyone out there taking my opinion and forcing it on people, tell them Wacky Modder says shut the fuck up. But, I will say this. To all of those who have a video on Sea Destiny, mainly the Destiny Gundam in particular, that I left a nasty comment on back in like 2010, 2011, I apologize. I was way out of line back then, hence why I took down my Destiny and Strike Freedom videos now to fix them, not only my attitude, but my facts as well. But yeah, I humbly apologize for doing that in the past because I was way out of line. Nowadays, comments that I put on like Seed and Seed Destiny videos are a lot more constructive than they are derogatory. I don't just bash for the sake of bashing like I did back in 2010, no. I don't do that no more. So yeah, I apologize for that. Second of all, it doesn't have to make sense? Okay, yeah. May I remind you, dude, Gundam has always followed the formula of futuristic, but realistically plausible. Well, with the exception of G Gundam and, to an extent, Turn A Gundam, that is. It, along with Macross, were the two cornerstone animes that started up the real robot mecha anime genre. It was based in the future, but the technology in play here was still realistically plausible, just in futuristic terms, that's all. You're basically telling me, okay, so what if the story is bad? It doesn't have to be good. Okay, let's be hypothetical for a second. So you're telling me if Gundam Sea Destiny had it where the Strike Freedom was fighting the legend when all of a sudden Kira does a beam spam, Derpy Hoops from My Little Pony pops up, takes a muffin with an antimatter explosive in it, throws it at the plants, everything blows up, everyone dies. You seriously want to tell me that I'm supposed to take that just lying down? Just as if nothing, nothing out of the ordinary just happened? While that would be fucking hilarious, yes, that would make no fucking sense whatsoever. No, you just can't do that. There are still rules when making an anime, my friend. And Sea Destiny broke a lot of them. Not only did it break the laws of physics, but it also broke the laws of storytelling as well. And in an anime like Gundam, you just don't do that unless there's a valid reason for it, like in G Gundam. Alright, so that was the final question of the night, and that's about all the time I have for now. I hope this answers a lot of your questions you had for me in the past, and I hope you enjoyed my little FAQ. So, until next time guys, this is Wacky WackyModer84. Peace out.